and welcome to another episode of NSC Finviz powered by CNBC TV 18 season 3. This week we are at the Navi Mumbai campus of India's first and only public listed KPO company eClerk Services. eClerk Services is India's first and only public listed knowledge process outsourcing company. Incorporated in the year 2000, the company provides critical middle and back office operations support through data management, analytics solutions and operational support. NSE Finviz visited eClerk Services in Mumbai with the country's finest experts to advise and educate the young employees on investments and financial planning. And we're now joined by our two very special experts. We have Gaurav Mashruwala, who's a personal finance planner. Welcome to the show, Gaurav. And we have Harsh Vadan Rungta, who's a certified financial planner with Rungta Securities. Welcome to the show, Harsh. Um, before I come to you, Harsh, for the first question, just like to let the audience know our core topic for today is gold investments. Harsh, let's start off. I want to talk to you about gold by way of how important is it to have gold in one's investment portfolio? Is it necessary to be invested in gold? Yeah, well, uh, Sumit, if you look at our investment habits over the period, over the centuries uh, till date one gold has been one source of uh, one product uh, which people like to invest into because it is a physical asset mm. you you can hold it you can feel it uh, you know it is a universal currency and you know you would can encash it immediately now when we come into modern era you know if you, your question is specifically what importance does gold have mm. in your investment portfolio mm. well you need to have gold in your portfolio there is no doubt about it okay. The problem is when you overdo, the allocation towards gold goes way beyond than what it should be. Ideally, what we suggest, when you invest into gold, what we mean by when we say invest into gold, we don't refer to jewellery. Jewellery is for personal consumption okay. and that should not be considered ideally as an allocation into gold. So if you are saying you have 100 rupees to invest, hmm. then 10% of that could be into gold. But not beyond that. Okay, cool. So, Gaurav, um, like uh, Harsh said, so jewelry shouldn't be counted as investment in gold. It's more of a consumption, which is one big myth here. We're going to get beaten up by our wives and mothers and the other women in the house. I blame it on you. Oh, blame it on me, of course. But uh, then, if if we are investing, we should be investing in gold. How do you decide what percentage? Should it, what percentage of my total portfolio should be in gold? So, Harsh already answered. He said about. 10 percent, 8 to 10 percent is an ideal way. Uh, so this is this is kind of a ballpark figure in which I completely agree. However, uh, you will have to look at your existing asset allocation. Number one is you know, how much is into debt, how much is into equity, number one. Also look at and then gold number number three or as part of it. Also uh, what I why are you putting into gold? So is it just, just to have a balanced portfolio? or is there any marriage in the offering or is there something for which you will require gold that's the second criteria third criteria is that does family already have a gold so look at that as well because lot many times it's like family has gold and huge amount of gold and invariably we inherit that because that's one asset class which normally people don't sell off so equity buying selling is more or less fine fixed deposits mature but gold is invariably gets on to next generation. So if family already has that, mm -hmm. it's, it's your parents who have it, you're going to inherit. So keep all these factors in mind before picking it up because it should not happen that we go overboard with okay. gold. So family has huge amount of gold and then you know grandparents also have it and then we end up looking at 10% of our portfolio. So be careful on that. Otherwise, 8 to 10% of gold as a part of overall portfolio is fine. Good. So now we get gold in the electronic form, so e-gold. So is that a great way to invest compared to maybe you know buying coins or bars of gold as an investment purpose? Is that a good way to go through gold ETFs, uh, e-gold, things like well, that? Well, actually this is a very interesting uh, uh, question because not many people are aware hmm. that you know there are multiple options on, uh, you know by uh, by which you can hold gold, you can buy gold. Right. Most traditional uh, form is through gold coins that we go into a jeweler's uh, shop, we pick up something you are aware there is a making charge over and above the cost of the gold. Now, if you are talking about investing into gold, there are different forms under which you can invest. So the first one being as we, as we spoke right now is a gold coin, which is a physical coin in your hand. There is a cost of storage, there is a risk of losing it, there is a purity risk. Okay, you have certified gold, but in case, you know, what if it does not turn out to be the 99.9% uh, the, the .9 or whatever that you have chosen. Convenience is one aspect under which you have different options. Now you have a gold ETF. 
what is a gold ETF? It's an uh, exchange traded fund. So you can buy it in a DMAT account. You don't need to hold it physically. There is no, uh, no, no problem of purity because it is certified and you know what kind of quality you're getting. Great. Okay. Uh, Akshit Karya. Gaurav, his question is, can gold funds equally give returns as physical gold? Um, you know, are those funds monitored by the SEBI? What's the thought on so that? So here, the valuation is based on the valuation of gold, number one. Any mutual fund is under the guidelines of SEBI. So if your question is that can gold fund manipulate and do something beyond SEBI guidelines and the answer is no. Uh, your question on is there a physical gold which is backed, yes it is. So all gold funds are backed by exactly the same amount of gold that is kept with the custodian, they are clear cut guidelines. So it, there cannot be a situation where you are purchasing a gold fund but there is no backing of gold or they are violating. So somebody could be manipulating and that's kind of an offense but otherwise all mutual funds are regulated by SEBI including gold funds and they have to adhere to SEBI guidelines. It's time for a short break here on NSC Finways powered by CNBC TV 18 season 3. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching NSE Finviz, powered by CNBC TV 18 Season 3. And today we're at the Navi Mumbai campus of eClerk Services. Got of uh, talking about not putting all the eggs in one basket. So that is one term that we love saying, which is asset allocation and diversification, which is also one, again, a key pillar, another great important part of personal financing. But simple terms, what is diversification? What is asset allocation? And I've heard there's a thumb rule. Do you agree with that thumb rule? Anybody knows that thumb rule? Okay. Okay. So, so, good. So, don't go for that thumb rule. In any case, it's not <laughs> well. So, it makes your life easier. A uh, lot many times, what we hear is that the younger you are, you should be putting more money into equity. When you keep growing, reduce your equity component, and that's not true. You need to look at what are you saving money for. Mm -hmm. If you are saving for an event in life, which is going to happen at the end of two or three years pick up a debt based instrument. Now I will try and give you some examples of what is debt based because debt again could be a kind of financial jargon for few. So a fixed deposit is a debt base. Any kind of investment where you get interest except debt funds, debt funds is again a product where you get dividend. So put into those instruments, you can put in fixed deposit, national saving certificate though they have a longer maturity. There could be recurring deposit, there could be some bond, some debenture. But if you are saving for an event which is likely to occur in next two to three years, you pick up a debt based instrument. If you are saving for something which is going to happen after seven, eight, nine years or beyond, look at equity. Now, equity is an asset class. There are various ways to invest. I mean, we had a couple of friends putting up their hands saying that they invest in equity directly. So that's one way. You can directly go and pick up stocks from stock market. Another way is equity mutual fund. So nobody invests in mutual fund. We invest through mutual fund. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very important to have this thing clear because invariably we feel uh, or we get questions where people say, feel I'm investing into a mutual fund. I'm investing into in insurance. We never invest into it. We invest through. So through mutual fund, you can invest into stock market. Through mutual fund, you can invest into gold. Through mutual fund, you can invest into bonds, debentures, which are debt based instruments. So if you are saving for something which is going to happen, which the event is likely to occur after seven to nine years or beyond, and the seven to nine years is what I feel. There are some who recommend five, some who recommend, but basically people are saying that if it's one or two years, equity is not the place that you put it in. So if you're trying to do that, then that much portion will go into equity for an interim period, make a combination. So it's mm. like in your overall portfolio, you will have certain amount of debt, you'll have certain amount of equity, you'll have certain amount of gold. A normal saying that goes is that if part of your portfolio is not giving negative returns, you're not diversified enough. When we're typically planning our portfolio or you know when I'm calculating the net, net present value of you know how much I need to invest today to have a particular amount say 20 years down the line, 
uh, you know the inflation rate that we take mm -hmm. now you know typically we take you know 5% 6% saying you know that's what ha it has been but uh, do we become uh, you know pessimist and say let's take an 8% you know when i'm calculating how much money i do i need to invest mm -hmm. or do i become a little more you know optimistic is say you know it's 6% today it'll be probably 4% at an average over the next 20 years so what do you think is the right number for the okay. inflation rate that you should take when uh, you know planning your portfolio sure how should one do that well rajit uh, what you asked is a very important question as to what rate do you assume because that is going to determine what money you're going to yeah. accumulate well it's always better to be pessimistic to think that why not prepare for an inflation rate to be 8% and have that excess money in case inflation is 4% over a period of time second element when we are talking about 8% is general inflation rate now if you break it up into smaller parts the food inflation the education the medical inflation their figures are far more than 8% so so the benchmark i mean when you get into the details obviously you'll find the education and medical inflation is far more than 8% so when you talk about cpi you know i would suggest personally that you be pessimistic in your approach there's no harm in having more money that is with you overall when you start planning from today you will take the worst case scenario which possibly would be 8% Hmm. after which you have to keep in mind that there is going to be inflation even after you retire inflation hmm. doesn't retire with you right hmm. so you need to make some provisions you need to have some investment options which help you beat inflation even then we all have our goals divided into our needs and uh, desires so how do we have a fixed percentage allocated in our savings that this particular percentage goes for the, uh, the need and the other in the desire is there any ratio for it so here it is there are two ways one is the logical is that first allocate entire thing for your needs and then go for desire that's number one alternatively prioritize pick and choose because it's up to you you have to decide that this is my priority so you can either prioritize one way second is do all your needs and then desires later on third is that you can probably pick up the near term needs first and then the desires and then the long term needs later on you're watching nse finwest powered by cnbc tv 18 season 3 it's time for a very short break don't go anywhere we'll be right back Welcome back. You're watching NSE Finviz powered by CNBC TV 18 season 3. I have two very special guests with me, Gaurav Mashruwala and Harshvardhan Rumta. Harsh, I want to talk to you about debt now. Debt is again, should be an important part of, an uh, important component of one's portfolio. And there are uh, multiple ways to do that. So when we spoken about fixed deposits, but another way of adding to your debt portfolio is these new schemes that the government, I mean like, sorry, not new schemes, but like PPF, which is obviously an old essential part. But sometimes people say that I don't want to invest in PPF. I get it in my salary. The part of it has, what do you say, mandatorily gets cut into that. But otherwise, what about things like PPF, NPS? How, how important should they be to get to invest in? Well, uh, what is debt? So Gaurav uh, gave you some bit of information as to what is debt in the initial when we started off. So, you know, within the debt space, there are two kinds of products. One that gives you a fixed coupon payment. Your fixed deposit is a, is a co fixed coupon payment. You know exactly what you will get after one year, after two years or whatever period, because there is an interest rate attached to it. Now there is another kind of investment, which is, does not tell you what exactly will you get because it's on a floating basis which is a debt mutual fund for example, mm. which could be your NPS in that category does not tell you exactly what you will get. PPF tells you exactly what you will get, right? So there are two kinds <coughs> of debt investments. Now which one should you take? Why you should take is a different question altogether. At one place you know what you will get. In an NPS, the PPF for example tells you that I will give you 8.7%. This is the interest rate which is fixed and this is what you will get for that particular year at least. NPS on the other hand is a product which basically is helping you to at the time of retirement, it helps you get pension. What returns will you get out of it? That dep depends entirely on the performance of the fund in which you have invested. So you need to have assets in your portfolio matching with your time horizon. So if you have anything requirement, any requirement which is immediate in nature, you need to have debt. Okay. If you have something which you can wait for a longer period of time, you need to have equities. In the interim, you want you can start with a balanced kind of a fund. When you have a portfolio, mm -hmm. single fund, 
which balances itself between equity and debt. Yes. So, answering the query whether debt is important in your portfolio, I believe there is no choice. Hmm. We all have short term requirements. If you have short term requirements, you need to have invest into debt. For example, I am having uh, rupees 1 lakh at uh, this point of time. So, how should I diversify my fund in three options like mutual fund, equity, and the gold scheme which you sh shared with us, like e gold and all? First, I already answered the part of it that we never invest in mutual funds. We invest through mutual fund. So, mutual fund is not an asset class. Your investment will be into either equity direct or through a mutual fund. It could be into gold direct or through mutual fund or a debt which is bond, debenture, a few other instruments either direct or through mutual fund. So, we knock mutual fund off and then we look at that if you have a lack of rupees today, how would you do it? Decide your goals. And if your goal is that you need money for higher education in six months time, then the only option that you have is a fixed deposit because you require that money in six months time. But if you are saying that I do not need any money for seven or eight years, it should be either direct equity or equity mutual fund. So, it does not matter. I mean, there cannot be a situation where there can be a thumb rule applied. We uh, all find ourselves in a situation where we have to take a loan. Uh, be it a personal or a gold loan, right? Uh, so, the point one here is like we have a lot of banks, institutions which are giving uh, gold loans now. So, which one is a better option? Is it a personal loan or a gold loan? And how does it relate to the fluctuating cost of gold and the tenure for which I am paying those uh, EMIs and the interest? Harsh, you want to take that? Yeah, so your question is if you are in need of a loan, should you go in for a personal loan or you should take a loan against the gold which you already own? Well, if you look at the interest rate, first comparison would be what rate of interest are you going to pay for a personal loan vis-a-vis -vis what rate of interest you are going to pay against a gold loan. Now, your specific question to gold loan, how does it work? Okay, if there is a value of gold which is a certain at the time of lending, which a gold finance company would do or a bank would do for that case. There is a margin which they keep, okay, which was earlier mandated to be 40 percent. So, they would lend you. RBI had you know, some time back come out with a regulation saying that you cannot lend for more than 60 percent of the value of the gold, which I believe they have now uh, got it back to 80 percent. Now, <coughs> that is the margin that the lending uh, you know, institution will keep with themselves. If the price of gold when you borrowed was say 10,000 rupees just for calculation purposes and you have got a loan for 8,000 rupees. If the value reduces, uh, reduces to 9,000 rupees, that is the market value. There is a, the gap has been reduced, a 20 percent margin is still not maintained. So, you will have to make good that margin. The bank will or the institution will call upon you to make the difference, make good the difference. So, which could be either in the form of lending more gold or repaying that part of money back. So, interest rate is going to be the factor. The purpose for which you require, I am sure personal loans are not available for 5 or 6 years at one stretch. Gold loans you could possibly roll over for a longer period of time. Well, that's all the time that we have. Thank you so much, Gaurav. Thank you so much, Harsh. Thank you so much for having us here. This was a very interactive session. I have the I had the opportunity to actually attend such sessions and uh, gain a little bit of knowledge more about where I was lacking. Though I am not from the uh, finance background, I am from the I am a telecom engineer, a telecom professional, you can say. So right now I've joined in digital marketing. So this is something new, with, uh, something out of the box. So it was a nice experience, I guess. Today's session was very helpful to us. Uh, Mr. Gaurav and Mr. Harshwardhan uh, told uh, taught us a lot of about. Uh, what exactly stocks are and how we can invest our stocks and how we can take our money in a good direction ahead. Well, that's all on this episode of NSC Finviz powered by CNBC TV 18 season 3. But here's a chance for you to win a cool goodie bag by answering this viewer question. What is the best way to invest in gold for the long term? Buy jewelry. Buy gold coins. Buy e-gold. Don't need to invest in gold. Send in your answers at fwq at network18online.com The correct answer to last week's viewer question is Option A. Term Plan Many thanks to all the viewers who sent in their replies. The winners to episode 5's viewer question are Prasad Kulkarni and Neeraj Singh.
We'll see you next week with another set of young employees at another company. Until then, from the entire team, many thanks for watching.